Thank you very much, Professor Kent, Kento Sensei. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, meeting us over the cyberspace and coming to Kyoto. And we are in Manila now, I guess. Yes. And thank you for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, Happy New Year. And I would like to apologize also together with the Happy New Year wishes because of my terrible uh, voice. I have my allergies. And yesterday we were drinking a lot. <laughs> And my voice is something like that, I'm so sorry, and I'll be coughing a lot. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my presentation is again about uh, 30 minutes, if I can manage, and it's, it is a quite broad topic actually, it's more like an introductory topic, international migration regimes and human security. My background is international relations, international political economy, Professor Ken mentioned in the beginning, kindly. And uh, my part in Afrasia, basically I, I'm doing actually, this time it's a little bit different, but I'm doing more on regional integration, regional cooperation issues, and migration, movement of people basically, in free trade agreements. I did that one earlier, and that one, while looking at regional integration policies, especially the first phase of Afrasia and the first year of Afrasia here, I was also doing environmental studies a little bit, and there, there was somehow this keyword correlation, this security issues or security concerns for environment, for regional integration issues. And in our group, we are discussing on migration mostly. And I was wondering, we are discussing migration from different perspectives, and we are discussing human security. Security and related to that one, human security in international relations and environmental concerns. And how about the correlation, relationship between migration and security and basically human security issues. I found it quite interesting and I was I mean, um, recalling back a little bit our discussions in the first phase, five years and in these three years, uh, we have different backgrounds and somehow it is quite closely related with human security but we don't mention or we didn't mention so much the concept itself. Maybe we were talking about it because we are basically talking about movement of people, migration, and it directly relates with the human security, individual security, community security, and national, national level security. And I, I just, during the second year of Raja this time actually, I just wanted to see the relationship between human security and migration issues. And as I'm doing more like international studies, international migration regimes, and how, how human security is being positioned within the changing trend of migration regimes at international level. Uh, so this is basically my inquiry here, <laughs> the slide is late. So the international migration, these are very simplistic definitions actually, and I'm not an expert, as Kira Sensei mentioned, I'm not an expert on migration, more than international politics and international security side, maybe I might say it a little bit. And the migration is basically a movement of people, rather than their origin of uh, country or origin. And human security is usually drastically also changing because migration issues, as we are always talking, even Kira Sensei's uh, presentation, <coughs> migration is somehow always changing at regional and international level. And human security is also quite changing concept since uh, the end of the Cold War. And how these two big concepts, they are just touching each other, but somehow we think about them separately, and how they are affecting each other. This was kind of the main inquiry also of this talk. And last year we had a nice panel in Macau in, uh, at ICAS meeting, and I presented just the relationship between human security and migration regimes in the beginning there. And this time I added a little bit of case studies. And um, soon I will, uh, very soon actually, I will, I will submit this paper for a journal here. <laughs> so today your comments will be very much welcomed uh, for my cases and uh, approach. So the presentation, first of all, looks at the theoretical framework of the changes in the migration regimes at international level, but of course it also uh, relates with the regional level. And the human security concept, how it's changing, how it's widening and covering the migration issues. Mm -hmm. But somehow, uh, in the literature of human security, we don't have migration issues so much. And how can we communicate these two concepts uh, with different cases? Uh, so the outline again, this is more like a paper outline, uh, the introduction of migration regimes, changing concept of human security, and communicating these two concepts, and securitization of international migration patterns especially environmental force migration, and also rural-urban transition. These are two important cases. There is also trade and movement of people 
case and its relation with human security, but this time I couldn't uh, manage to include it within the presentation, so it will be edited in the paper. Uh, and last, because um, in the beginning we said that it's going to be more like one of our last meetings for Group 1, I added one slide as my uh, three years old experience and um, what I had done, what I couldn't do uh, in streets. So, uh, the first part is quite introductory. I think everyone is a migration expert. You all know this. This is quite historical. This is from the 17th to the 19th century, and uh, how the migration trends or how people were moving, usually from Europe to other places or from Africa into Africa, and from China and from India, we have the migration direction until the 19th century. And the reason my, uh, coming from 19th century to 21st century, or late 1990s, these are the data from 2010 and 11, that uh, is recent. Uh, now, I think we all, we all know all these figures, actually, and you could have say, mentioned a little bit. We have women. It's even, there's a concept like feminization of migration now. Even women's movement is quite interesting, and we see that also in the Philippines a lot. We talk about it a lot also. There are now, almost 220 people uh, living outside of their country of origin. It's 3.1% of the world population. And when we think about migration, again, I'm looking at it from like, with this very basic definition, moving from your country of origin. And there are all sorts of movements, not only uh, like Filipinos moving for job opportunities to other countries, not only like that, but environmental force movement, moving from rural places to urban places, moving from, uh, because of the, natural disasters and because of war, for example, because of conflicts, including all those wounds of people. And uh, when we look at that one also, we have internal displaced people. That's also part of migration, according to this definition. Uh, it's in more than 52 countries. It's one quarter of all countries in the world, actually. And we have refugees, almost um, 15 million people. Again, this is also um, in a way forcing the human security concept to include, to be inclusive of all migration issues a little bit more. And then you look at the migration trends, what kind of actors are involved with, in, in this migration governance or migration regimes. Uh, we have governments, government agencies. We saw that in the Philippines we had interviews, actually it was a quite nice ch chance for us. And then we have regional and international organizations, we have migration networks, and the migration networks are coming quite important. The companies <coughs> at local, national level, NGOs, local NGOs and international NGOs now quite interested in migration issues, unions and communities. Because people are moving, we are moving at individual level, at family, family level, in community level. So communities are actually at the first stage, they are being faced with the migration and the impact of migration or the results of migration. So their security concerns are coming at the first level, so that is very important. So the bottom-up direction uh, affecting individuals and communities are more important. These are like the important signs that I put in a different color. <laughs> And the level of governance, there are country level unilateral actions, bilateral agreements, regional processes, international regimes like at international level treaties, conventions, um, proposed by, for example, United Nations is quite interesting in this movement of people historically. There are multilateral forums, there are regional forums, and there are all sorts of different levels of um, communication uh, frame of frameworks. They are trying to propose or provide communities or countries with a framework of migration, how to make migration a little bit less problems. So what kind of interaction are there among these different levels? That is one concern when we just look at only just migration trends uh, in recent years. And these are my questions actually. Uh, what are the reaction responses of the sending and receiving countries to these complex level of relationships? And then what level of security implication do these agencies, all these agencies, measure or they consider? For example, how about the Philippine government when they think about when they create their migration policies, how much concern they have um, in terms of human security or security aspect of their migrants, immigrants, uh, when they design their policies? Uh, this is again quite thematic. This is a quite old slide actually. There are basically government to government bilateral. Uh, frameworks, there are government to government multilateral frameworks, transgovernmental government to bilateral and government to private frameworks, and private to private frameworks. Uh, and again, while looking at the realities, what we have, especially in Asia, these are all um, 
this is all the region breaks actually we have Europe to Africa here and while we are in Asia now uh, 30 to 33 million people are moving into national migrants and the percentage is some something like this and this orange is the 40 almost 50 percent is women and then internal displaced people 4.6 million altogether uh, and refugees especially Pakistan Iran and China thinking about Asia at large we have four million refugees also um, including migration in its uh, wider sense well I'm just pointing out at the numbers I don't know if you can see on the Filipino side actually no okay so I try to speak it more so it's very important, and especially internal displaced people and refugees. For example, I'm from Turkey, by the way. Uh, that's why I made it in orange. In Turkey, also, it's also some of the top countries. They have internal displaced people, especially now. There are so many Syrians uh, just escaped from the war in Syria, unfortunately. They say 100,000 people, some says more even. And we have this migration problem in Turkey, and directly human security issue. How can we provide a decent uh, standard of living? That is the basic definition of human security, decent standard of living for these people. So the trends in the 90s, when we look at just migration trends, somehow we have the um, impact or the uh, emergence of the idea of security concerns. For example, changing destinations, temporary migration of labor, we have growth of irregular migration. When there's irregular migration, it, the people have the security concerns. They have housing concerns. They have education concerns for their children, for example. And that directly correlates with the human security concept with its uh, large definition. We have women impact also. Increasing mobilities, networks, transformation in combination low transportation costs. So this increases the level of migration, phase of migration. And at the same time, the problems, the concerns about human security at individual level, at its basic uh, level, when, when they start to get concerned about their securities, actually. And um, also, one thing, actually, this one we discussed, as I tried to discuss in ICAS last year, engagement of mechanisms for the returnees with political, economic, and cultural impact. And the Kina Sensei talked about this now. Uh, how the returnees can be involved within their original societies because they have different changes, their children, their, their languages, and how they can be involved and feel coming back home again without any security consideration or without feeling insecure and in their home countries. So that is also one uh, impact of, or one aspect of human security concern within migration. And the global migrations, it was usually, when we think about the Cold War period, where human security was more like defined as the classical understanding of <coughs> national security in the Cold War years, it was how we were moving actually, or our fathers, mothers were moving, it was basically Europe, Somehow, I think it was just after the, after the uh, Second World War and the Europe was getting a little bit much uh, prosperous compared to other places, so people were just moving in a way um, more like uh, swimming towards Europe, it seems like. <laughs> uh, so it was a center of migration uh, from Asian side and from other sides as well. And when we look at the migration issues today, the more we talk about the problems of international migration regimes of all those agencies, the more uh, we realize the relationship with the security concerns, security issues. Again, I'm underlining this a lot and checking my time. Yes. And um, first of all, these are actually general problems with the international migration regimes, lack of complementary regulation mechanisms at international and regional levels. <coughs> Sorry. For example, in, in, when it's related to trade, WTO still couldn't provide a proper mechanism for people's movement within their free trade agreements, which is my original work actually, and it is still a problem and it definitely creates uh, security concerns for, for uh, workers, for example, in their host countries or in their receiving countries. NGOs versus government versus international and regional organizations. I, in a way, realized this in, in the Philippines when we had interviews and how NGOs and government have, uh, what kind of problems they have while communicating with each other. And this again creates direct relation or direct impact on the security side of people's 
uh, livelihoods. And the legal definition of migration, it is still a problem because there are lots of definitions. Migrants, migration, immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, for example. We have sometimes in, in Japan, for example, professional, skilled, unskilled workers. And in the host countries, depending on their official definition or legal definition, what kind of legal conditions that they are provided with, what kind of security concerns that they face in their daily lives, that is becoming a big uh, problem. And I think that's why, and also how the host countries are receiving those migrants, and somehow there are these problems in between the host country and the migrants. And in Europe, for example, we had all the troubles earlier in the last couple of years. And that creates direct security threats somehow, sometimes, uh, against migrants. That's also uh, within definition of large concept of human security. So finally, coming to the second part, uh, changing concept of human security. Again, just looking at the security with, with its with a very basic approach, whose security we are talking about, and what kind of agents, again, we are talking about, and what kind of value should we secure for people's, again, and it's, um, simplest definition, decent living standards for human. And how security concept is changing uh, during the Cold War years, becoming, or it's, it's usually, this classical understanding, it is uh, like, I used this one also in ICAS before, the state-oriented definition of security. And two years with the impact of globalization in 1970s, and the impact of political economic interaction in between companies, societies, and the states, and around the uh, rigid walls of statehood in Europe, in America also, it is becoming from more like a state-oriented, more like a human-focused um, definition of security. And within security, the idea of human security is becoming like during 19, late 1980s or early 1990s, the idea of human security is becoming more like a popular than the nation state related national security. Then we have the first time 1994 Human Development Report, we have the uh, human security as itself, separate from the security. We have the seven pillars, and there there is political security, provision of human uh, rights, and personal security. For example, protection of individuals against personal violence. And when we look at the issues of migration, we sometimes, again, as I said before, see quite a lot of, especially in Europe, violent uh, instances also in Europe between the host the communities and the migrant communities. In London, in Paris, for example, we had all the um, problems. And this also creates direct threat to against human security in its large definition. And these are some other organizations related, or they are trying to define the wider concept of sec human security. For example, recently it is also migration, oops, sorry, it is also related with uh, development issues. What is the development level at individual level, actually? What is the development at individual level? It is capable to achieve human well being and satisfaction with basic needs. Again, decent level of um, living standards, whether the governments, whether sending governments or countries or receiving countries, whether they can provide this for their individuals, for their uh, societies, be it their own communities, be it migrant communities. Then how can we communicate with the changing concept of human security and the changing uh, scope of migration or mig migration regimes? Again, we have different trends which are forcing human security and also migration to be reconsidered. We have globalization, changing world agenda after September 11. We have, uh, again, trade-related uh, migration issues, movement of people, for example, between Philippines, Japan. We have all these FTA-related movement of nurses, for example, and how whether the Japanese government is providing a secure environment for those nurses when they come to Japan to work. And most of the cases we saw, not so much like language problems, education problems, job opportunities. And then uh, voluntary and forced movements, again this is coming back to the wider definition of migration, armed conflicts, disasters, environmental change, they are all forcing people to move, whether within their own countries or moving, leaving their countries like in Syria, going to Turkey or escaping, trying to Turkey, trying to escape to Europe. 
this is also migration, and this is the direct threat to security layers and, and refugees again, and accommodating irregular migration returnees, sorry, uh, within the host countries. And within the host countries, in the receiving countries, like in ICAS earlier, I was only considering or looking at the issue from the sending country point of view. This time I tried to include the receiving country also. In the receiving countries, we have discrimination, racism, xenophobia, multiculturalism issues. This is the keyword we are discussing a lot at Afrasia. And integration. How can they integrate those migrants within the societies? Again, this is a broad topic that uh, we have been discussing. And uh, coming back to human security concept, whether human security is changing, whether, because as I said in the very beginning, uh, we usually don't have the migration <coughs> term, even as a term within the human security literature. So this is one important report from 2003, uh, Human Security Report of the UN Commission on Human Security. And they have, this is a summary actually, this is, there's, they have one line, security of people on the moon. I don't know whether this correlates with migration or not, but I found this is somehow relevant with migration. And again, they underline working to provide minimum living standards. But what kind of working condition? Because in most cases, when we think about migration, we talk about people are moving because of better living standards, working standards, and working to provide minimum living standards, whether they are provided with that or not in the receiving or sending countries when they get back. And universal access to basic health care, this is also one important part of human security now with its most recent definition. Again, whether migrants are provided with that one or not, this is again security concern. So the correlation between the widening scope of international migration and its outcomes with the widening definition of human security. And uh, one recent book actually, I got this through Afrasia, I like this book, The Age of Migration, maybe you know this book, there they are defining migration, the today migration, it is more like securitization of migration issues, globalization of migration, acceleration of migration, differentiation, feminization, politization, politicization, sorry, proliferation of migration transition. These are all in fact defining migration today. And when you look at the human security literature, we see correlation in between these concepts, defining these two different terms. So the, we can even call or conclude that rising security concerns uh, for migrants, for migration issues at individual, community, and even state levels. Yes, I have seven minutes. So when we look at from the same book, actually, when we look at the Asia Pacific um, realities, sorry. <coughs> Uh, so as we can see, we have today we are talking about the Philippines. It is uh, I think we talked about this one earlier in our phase one also. Philippines to uh, the Middle East a little bit, and then there there I think there should also be something towards uh, U.S. I think this one okay to U.S. and Canada. This also correlates with what Ikeda Sensei mentioned, and there is also from the Philippines to Japan. These are the recent trends how people are moving in Asia Pacific. Uh, today. And for example, from China we have to Japan, that's why we have, sorry, is this me? Yeah. We have issues, for example, in Japan we usually discuss these uh, Chinese, how to include them, like Koreans and other immigrants in Japan. Yeah, I think that's me, I cannot manage using this. <laughs> yeah, so if you look at the recent wider concept of human security, and we have one, this one I used before also. And th this, in a way, takes all these theoretical discussions or literature review to the cases. Uh, there's the work, the recent work on how to define human security and human security index. And they have three components, ecological, social, and economic fabrics, or they call it fabrics, but they don't have migration indicator. But if you look at the literature that, that we looked a little bit earlier, and there are so many things that they actually t are talking about multiple people and migration, but they don't have a specific fabric on migration. Um, well, I think we don't have time to... Maybe the economic index might be relevant a little bit with the uh, human security, the high human security places, or the, or the human security threats, or the lower levels. And they try to make a um, world map, depending on the level of human security and insecurity in different countries according to social, economic, and environmental fabrics. 
But if we dig into all these country dynamics and data, we often face with migration cases, with women or people cases. And the composite one is something like that. And as you can see, the human or insecurity, the higher level of human insecurity, it is usually internal displaced people, refugees, internal wars, how civil wars, how uh, we have the impact of these. And these are usually the people who are moving, in a way, living their countries in Africa in this part. Yeah. And the cases, I have two cases here. I would like to uh, make it a little bit larger in the paper, in my discussion, actually. I have four minutes. Um, first of all, environmental force migration. I also mentioned a little bit already. Uh, there was one big project, it lasted about 10 years, I guess. Um, it, this is the abbreviation Global Environmental Change and Human Security. <laughs> How simple it is. It's a trans research project looking at the global environmental change and human security and the impact, how they are affecting each other. Um, they ended already in the recent years, um, I think last year it ended totally. And there they are explaining the human security, especially in this part. <laughs> environmental changes can contribute to overall threats and pressures and detrimental to human security. <coughs> and they undermine the capacity to take any measure by individuals and community levels. This is basically environmental change, how environmental changes are forcing people to change their places, to get back to their original living standards or to better their living standards in its basic definition, and uh, how this is forcing people to leave their original places. This is either country of origin or either their original or the recent place that they, they were living. So that is one thing. Um, environmental change is how they're affecting, forcing uh, people to migratory processes. Sorry. I'm skipping around <laughs> here. Um, so uh, I think I don't have so much time, maybe with questions also we can dig this a little bit more. In a way, how environment is forcing people, and first of all, they are creating an insecure environment for people to keep their um, living standards, and the people feel going, migrating. That is one case, and within environmental force uh, migration, we have one rural urban transition. We also have this within environmental studies that we use this. Uh, I just gave some uh, examples because these are usually the cities like Tokyo, Guangzhou, Seoul, Delhi, Mumbai, where people's movement are quite fast. Whether they are coming to the country, to coming to the city, they are living in the city, and there are quite important amount of movement of people when we think about migration at large. And just one thing actually, maybe to eat and one thing uh, to underline, this is not all international migration, but this is also, in a way, migration within the country. People moving from rural areas to urban to increase their living <coughs> standards, or they feel forced because of the environmental difficulties at their rural areas. They try to move, or they feel forced moving to urban places. But when they move to urban places, again, now we have bigger population in urban places, and we have the problem of urban services. This is again the country, sorry, the cities. Uh, and the countries how their urban populations are growing. By the way, um, in by the year 2050, 70, more than 70% of the Asian population will be living in cities, in big cities. So that is going to be a big problem actually for us, for Asia, with urbanization and people moving, migrating, and how how we can accommodate all these people and how we can provide. We call it urban services, like the basic living standards in an urban place, how we can provide urban service for all these growing population in urban areas. And these are some indicators on development and human rights factors, environmental factors, and service factors, like providing uh, low level of carbon emissions, health risk, how the waste management, because these are all affecting when people migrate to be, because usually even in the country, even in international migration, people do not go from the Philippines to the rural areas, but they usually go to cities for work conditions. And then how in those cities the urbanization is then going bigger, and how the uh, managers or the uh, local governments in the cities, how they can manage 
This is uh, this growing population with migrants also in their uh, environments with all these impacts. So these are some cases, and they show these are usually related to the environment, but they show how migration movement of people is directly related with their security levels or with the conditions that people might feel secure at individual level and I'm underlying this many times and how they can continue their living standards. And as a conclusion, um, these are just a summary of how migration trends are changing and how human security trends are changing. Of all these slides, I, I made a little summary. Maybe you can have a look at it later. But as a conclusion, there is a multi-level analysis. We need to include all these changing security concerns and also changing or changing definition of migration in recent years. Because as uh, we saw it earlier, with the age of migration book, we have politicization, politicization, feminization, globalization of migration in the recent years. And uh, rather than looking at the cause-effect relation, uh, how about looking for the multi-agent approach, trying to the uh, multi-agents, trying to look at the sec human security-related agents and also migration-related agents and the uh, management level. And also impact of migration not only for sending countries because human security is everywhere, our security concerns, and also in the uh, receiving countries. And also bringing migration discussions within the human security discussion because, as I said in the beginning, uh, when we look at the literature or given my limited research, we don't have that much of migration discussions within the human security literature today. And the bottom-up approach because when we think about human security, it's basically my own security at individual level. Uh, so this is, I think, these are some selected references. This is how I uh, did my preparation and also I, I made it into a paper and with your comments I will just submit it to this side. <laughs> <laughs> and um, do I have time or do we have time to discuss this one? Because earlier, as I said, this is my last slide. Okay. Uh, our three years, because I thought that this is the uh, research meeting, all members. I don't know about how much our counterparts, uh, Filipino colleagues, are concerned with this part. I didn't know that part, actually. And I thought that we are also discussing our three years of report a little bit, what we did so far. Should we discuss this now or later? Okay. Then I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Yes.